Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. We have an exclusive interview with great value investor and financial thought leader Joel Greenblatt this week. He is living proof that active management can still work really well. Greenblatt is managing principal and co-chief investment officer of Gotham Asset Management, which he founded in 2009, and where he co-manages hedge funds and several hedge fund-like mutual funds utilizing long-short strategies. His early claim to investment fame was at his predecessor firm, Gotham Capital, where he co-managed an extremely concentrated hedge fund with 34% annualized returns over 10 years before he closed it to outside investors because he realized its volatility was too difficult for even sophisticated investors to handle. His behavioral insight that the best investment strategy is one that both makes sense and that you can stick with led to the creation of the Gotham Index Plus Fund in 2015. Index Plus combines index investing tied to the S&P 500 with actively managed long short strategies where the fund owns goes long the S&P stock selling at the biggest discount to Gotham's estimate of their value, recently 262 of them, and sells short the companies Gotham estimates are trading at the greatest premium, recently 236 names. Rated five-star by Morningstar, Gotham Index Plus has beaten the market and its sizable large-cap blend category by wide margin since inception. The proposition that active management still works can be made on a case-by-case basis in the highly competitive stock mutual fund business, but it doesn't hold up in general. Morningstar's latest active passive barometer report found that just 38% of active U.S. stock funds survived and outperformed their average passive peers in 2018, down from 46% in 2017. Active value funds saw the biggest decline with only 26% beating the passive value competition. The longer-term record is even worse. Only 24% of all active funds topped their average passive rival over the 10-year period ending December 2018. In Greenblatt's opinion, the investment flows to passive will continue. The reason that uh, the wave to passive is really here to stay, I mean, whether there'll be some little uh, travels up or down uh, over time, Big picture, you know, I gave a talk at Google a few years ago and I started it this way. Uh, You know, even Warren Buffett says most people should just index. And then I said, I agree with him. And then I left. No, then I said, (laughs) uh, you know, but then again, Warren Buffett doesn't index and neither do I, how come? And so there's a big dichotomy. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, the safest thing to do is to index. Uh, investing in stocks is really about valuing businesses and try to buy them at a discount. Your other alternative, if you can't do that, your other alternative is to find a manager who has a good process and sticking with that. Uh, But I wrote a book a number of years ago, I think in 2011, called The Big Secret. And my line is always that it's still a big secret because no one bought that book. Uh, But in it, I talked about uh, the best performing mutual fund for the period 2000 to 2010. And that fund was up 18% a year. But the average investor in that fund, oh, the market was flat during that decade. Right. So up 18% a year was pretty good. Uh, the average investor in that fund managed to lose 11% a year on a dollar weighted basis by moving in and out, in and out at all the wrong times. After the market went up, after the market went up, people piled in. After the fund outperformed, they piled in. After the market went down, they piled out. Or after the fund underperformed, they piled out and turned that 18% annual gain into an 11% dollar weighted loss. And that's just the way people are. If you don't know what the manager is doing, uh, you look at past returns. uh, But there's been plenty of studies showing the last one, three, five years don't have much to do with the next one, three, five. And really right. what you're supposed to do is look at process. And finding a good manager and assessing that, most people don't have that skill set either. I think uh, the good news is that if most people just index, uh, if you're a stock picker and actually do the work, uh, there's less competition. Yep. And I think that'll be helpful as a stock picker long term. But the active management business will still continue to be threatened. You know, even if investors understand what the manager's doing, at least they're investing in a fund and they think they do, But even if they understand that going in, 
they just can't stand it when he underperforms or when a fund underperforms. So it's not even as if you don't understand the manager in the process. It's that psychologically, right, from a behavioral finance point of view, you can't take the pain. Is that no, that's just the way it is? Sure. With uh, us. Understand human with, nature. With everyone. I mean, right. absolutely. Uh, you know, the other study I wrote up in the same book was about uh, the best performing uh, institutional funds for the same decade, looking at the top quartile uh, managers, mm-hmm. half of them, 47%, spent at least three of those 10 years, even though they ended up with the best 10-year record, they spent at least three of those years in the bottom decile. Bottom, bottom decile. 10, bottom 10%. So right. it's very painful, but to beat the market, you have to do something different than the market. Your returns are going to zig and zag differently. And even if you're a manager who can stick with your process, and that's who ends up winning at the end, very hard to get your clients to believe in you after you've had a couple bad years. Right. Uh, it's also hard to keep your job unless you happen to be running your own sure, shop. There, right. there, there's, as you mentioned, there are behavioral problems and there are really agency problems. Even if you're at a large endowment, you know, like uh, I sat on the board of university endowments. Mm-hmm. But think of the difficulty of the allocators at that endowment. While a uh, university is effectively a perpetuity, uh, there's no pension that you have to pay out. There's nobody retiring. It's mm-hmm. basically a perpetuity. should have the longest time horizon of anyone. But there's a gentleman or a woman who allocates to uh, U.S. equity managers right. or private equity managers or bond managers or whatever it is. And they're viewed over a three-year time horizon. It doesn't mean they lose their jobs, but they're They'd like to win. They'd like to beat their benchmark over that three-year period. Right. And as I always say, no one really gets fired, but no one throws your parade either if you haven't beaten your benchmark. So there's an agency problem even in the funds that should have the longest time horizon. So once again, I view that as good news for stock pickers because right. if other people aren't patient, uh, and you can be, it's, a, it's, it's really a great way to make money. You know, I read a great uh, book uh, this past summer. It's called Astro Ball. Mm-hmm. And it was really written by a Sports Illustrated, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a next generation Moneyball mm-hmm. book. Uh, but it was, talked right. about the Houston Astros and how in 2014 they were the last place, they were the worst team in baseball. And a Sports Illustrated writer wrote a story about them. He thought it would be buried in the magazine saying that, uh, I think seriously, that uh, the Astros were going to be the World Series champions in 2017. Based it, on on what they were doing. And Mm -hmm. so in 2014, actually, to their credit, Sports Illustrated put on their cover Houston Astros 2017 World Series champions. And of of course, they won the World Series in 2017, going from the worst team to the best team. And what did they do? Uh, They took a long time horizon. So usually most teams are trying to win now and they're trying to get players and playing their best players right now and trying to get the best players right Mm -hmm. now so they can win the most games. But if your focus is only on doing really well three years from now, well, you're going to start playing some of the players that you're trying to develop. Right. And you're only going to try to get people who are still going to be with you three years from now. And so you make all your decisions based on the long term. And that really worked out for them. And I think it's the same thing in investing. Most people are judged over very short periods of time. Mm-hmm. And so that's how many managers are, you know, you don't want to pick stocks that, uh, of companies that aren't going to do well in the next few years. But sometimes those are the, the best prospects, you know, thereafter once they've gone through the, the tough period. That's why you're getting the bargain. And so if you're actually focused on what's going to happen three, four years from now, you're kind of alone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's called time arbitrage, mm-hmm. just waiting right. for the market uh, to agree with you. What happens in the short term could be very ugly. Time horizons are actually shrinking. Mm-hmm. They're not growing. And so uh, as much as I said unkind things about active management, the opportunity set is really quite nice for people who uh, view stocks as ownership shares of businesses that they simply right. value and try to buy at a discount. Uh, it sounds ridiculously simple, but you know, it'll be a nice world for, mm-hmm. for stock pickers. Uh, you know, we've had a 10-year bull market. And, uh, you know, we see all sorts of signs of, you know, corporate earnings are starting to slow down. Uh, the economy is starting to slow down. We've got a you know, global slowdown. I mean, aren't we possibly entering an era where the stock market is not going to do that well? We've been valuing the stocks in the S&P 500. And we can do that uh, based on the way that we value businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
based on varying measures of absolute relative value that we've always used. And we can go back uh, to 1990 where we have good data. So where do we stand today versus the last 28 years? Mm -hmm. And doing it that way right now, you know, based on our data, we sit in the 16th percentile towards expensive over the last 28 years. That means the market has been cheaper 84% of the time and, and more expensive 16% of the time. And this isn't a prediction, but what we can do is go back in time and say from the 16th percentile in the past, What's happened right. over the next year or two? What has happened? Uh, year forward returns have averaged about 4 or 5% a year mm -hmm. uh, going forward and uh, 9 to 11 over the next two years. Mm -hmm. So not terrible, not negative, even yeah. though we're above average uh, in valuation. Uh, market averaged about uh, 9 or 10% returns during the 28 years we looked at. So certainly subnormal, right. uh, but not negative. Of course, your opportunity set is not just what's in front of you today, but what might be in front of you 9 or 12 months months from now or even two years from now. Mm -hmm. So should you be patient and hope for better opportunities? And that one I can't help you with. I can tell you for the Russell 2000, we're in the fourth percentile. That's stock number 1001 through 3000 in market so cap. So it's been, it's 96% of the time it's been cheaper. Yes, the it's Russell very, 2000. very expensive. Small oh. cap stocks, the right. Russell 2000, super expensive. Uh, in the fourth percentile, only been more expensive 4% of the time mm -hmm. over the last 28 years, been cheaper 96% of the time. When it's been here in the past, year forward returns have been negative 2 to negative 4%. Oh, interesting. So a totally different story. And, you know, it, it, like we do, we short stocks. Right. So if you, we don't short the index, we short the most expensive stocks in that expensive right, in index. Right, the Russell 2000. So hopefully our opportunity set is uh, is pretty nice on the short side mm -hmm. in the small caps. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been hurting us uh, for a little while. We Luckily, we've been making money on the long side. But right. on the short side, those have been uh, hurting us for quite a while. But we're short the most expensive stocks in a very expensive index. So we think our opportunity set is, mm -hmm. is really good there and much, much greater than in the large cap space. So when we go put Putting together a portfolio now, we're finding the relative bargains more, more in the large cap space, even though they've done quite well, and uh, the most expensive stocks in the small cap space. Value investing has underperformed uh, momentum, underperformed growth, uh, more to the point. Uh, is, so is active management in value investing in big trouble? Well, that's a great question. You know, value outperformed the way, you know, Morningstar Russell defined it for a long period of time up till 2006. And then since 2006, the last 12 years, growth has outperformed by 5%. You know, it's beaten the market by right. 5%. So uh, people often ask, you know, is value investing dead? And, you know, I answer it this way. Uh, uh, yes, no, maybe, I don't care. And... <laughs> And the reason is, is okay. because it really depends how you define value. Uh, the type of value uh, that's used when Russell or Morningstar define it really has to do with low price to book, low price sales stocks. And those are factors that have correlated with cheap stocks in the past. Um, but our definition of value is different. We value businesses. That's what stocks are, mm -hmm. ownership shares mm -hmm. of businesses. They're not pieces of paper that bounce around that you put fancy ratios on. They're actually ownership shares of businesses. Mm -hmm. And so we value businesses and try to buy them at a discount. Mm -hmm. That's our definition of value investing. Both Russell and Morningstar put us in blend, meaning we're not low price book, low price sales investors. As Warren Buffett has often said, value and growth are tied at the hip. Growth is part of valuation. So if we were private equity investors, which is the way, you know, we're going to buy the whole business. That's mm -hmm. the way we value businesses. Like, we're going to own the whole thing. They don't buy whole businesses, private equity firms, based on low price book, low price sales. They're looking at cash flows. Right. And that's what we're looking at. You know, what are the cash flows? How much are they going to grow? This is how we're going to value the business. That what we do. And so it doesn't make sense that if you're good at valuing businesses and then can buy them at a discount, that that should ever go out of favor. Mm -hmm. So if you believe what Ben Graham said, you know, Warren Buffett's mm -hmm. teacher, that this horizontal line is fair value and this wavy line around that horizontal line are stock prices and you have a disciplined strategy to buy more than your fair shares of companies when they're below the line, and if you're so inclined to sell or sell short more than your fair share when they're above the line, the fair value line, market's throwing us pitches all the time. You just have to be cold and disciplined to be able to take advantage of them, and that's really hard. And you're still getting the pitches even when the markets you know, are valued at kind of near historic highs. Okay. So we go in cycles, <laughs> yeah. and you know, we've had a good run. That's true, but uh, we always have shakeouts. 
just the nature of the beast. People get very emotional. And, right. uh, and you know, if you're patient, that was just the last 20 years. A lot of doubling and having, doubling and having. So right. I think uh, the world won't change. And the reason for that really is simply, you can throw all the computers you want into this. People are people and people don't change. And so that's really what we have going for us. One of the reasons you created the Gotham Plus Index Fund was because that people just couldn't take the variation in the re returns, anything that deviated tremendously from what was happening in the market. And the Gotham Index Plus Fund has knocked the lights out. So congratulations on that. Thank Why you. has the performance been so Good. I think we've done well because we're doing what we said we're going to do. Uh, number one, Gotham Index Plus was, was made not to have too much underperformance on any annual period uh, right. below the S&P 500. Why? Because most people use the S&P 500 as their benchmark to whether you beat the market or not. Most people can't take the pain when you underperform by a lot. So we structured the fund so that we could take advantage of our stock picking, uh, but we tried to mitigate the periods of underperformance by making compromises, mm -hmm. basically. So what the fund really is, is uh, you give us a dollar, we'll go invest in the S&P 500. We'll put a dollar into the S&P 500, the underlying stocks. And then we'll go out and buy 90 cents more of our favorite S&P stocks, and we'll short 90 cents of our least favorite. Where's our the compromise there? The compromise is, is in the 90-90 long short overlay. So in other words, uh, we buy the 90 cents of the cheapest stocks, we short the 90 cents of the most expensive stocks. Right, by your valuations. By right. our valuations, right. subject to certain constraints. Number one, that 90-90, we keep a zero beta because we're already long mm -hmm. a dollar in the S&P 500. Second, we don't want small stocks to drive returns. So let's say we really like a company, but it's only 0.01% of the S&P 500. If we really like it, we'll buy more of it, and even five or eight times more. Mm -hmm. of it than what's in the S&P, but that's only 0.05 or 0.08. Those stocks aren't really going to drive uh, the returns, and therefore it yeah. won't drive tracking error to the S&P 500. And the third thing we do is we match fundamentals. So in other words, when we're short companies, uh, usually the ones we don't like are the ones trading at 50, 100, 200 times pre-tax free mm -hmm. cash flows. Why are they trading so high? It's because they're not earning tons of cash flow yet, but people think in 2025 it's going to be great. Uh, so there are other fundamentals about that business that look good, like sales are growing really fast and other fundamentals are doing well. So we actually balance fundamentals. So you'll see on the 90 cents that we're buying as the cheapest, our sales growth in that 90 cents is just as good as the sales growth in our shorts. So in other words, we're making hmm. compromises. We're balanced, buying the cheapest we can find, shorting the most expensive. We hope that the 90-90 long short overlay adds to the return of the S&P 500, uh, but without too much pain for the investor. And you know, I wrote an essay about this, and I said the strategy that's best for you is not only one that makes sense, but one you can you stay with. You can stick with. with, right, stay And with. so I told you about the history of how even top managers zig and zag wildly. Yes. Uh, from and, and no one gets to stay with them because, uh, because they have long periods of underperformance. So we're trying to mitigate that. We're trying to minimize that uh, so that people can stay with us and collect the active premium that we're trying to bring. So it's really uh, a way to uh, navigate uh, what's going on right. in the world where you're taking human nature into account. What do you do in a situation like Boeing where they have kind of an unexpected crisis with the 737 MAX, and, you know, what do you do in a fund like the Gotham Index Plus Fund? Uh, well, that's a great question. Bad things happen um, from time to time. Unexpected bad things happen. And you, you I bought, would assume you were long Boeing? I don't know. Well, we were long Boeing, but uh, pretty much in line with the market. So okay. uh, it wasn't a stock that we had overweighted. So we lost in line with the market. So on a relative basis, it didn't hurt us. But that can hurt us in any particular stock, even if we like it. If there is unexpectedly bad news that is a one-time nature, uh, like what happened with Boeing, uh, over the short term, we could get hurt. In that particular name, we didn't. Uh, relative to the market anyway, uh, but certainly when bad things happen. That's why we own hundreds of stocks on the long side and hundreds of stocks on the short side. We have a combination of lucky things happening for us and then bad luck, and hopefully they come out in the wash. You don't expect index funds to blow up in investors' faces. I mean, you don't... Uh, well, they could lose money. Like I said, the I mean, S&P 500 is in the 16th percentile. Uh, right. If uh, but it could fall 20% tomorrow. So, so you're, you know, you're owning the, the biggest 
market cap, and therefore those are the, you know, think about the fangs. Um, is, isn't that dangerous for the average investor? Well, stocks are expensive, but still expecting positive returns. Even the S&P 500 has weighted. So stock investing is dangerous. When you invest in stocks, uh, the market could fall for any reasons that we don't know, 20, 30, 40% in a year. Right. It doesn't matter whether you're in an index, whether you're in an active fund, they'll all pretty much go down together. Uh, so that can always happen. And if you're not prepared for that, uh, then, then you will be surprised. That's why people decide, you know what? I can't put all my money into stocks. Maybe I can live with 60% net long or 70% net long because I can take a 25% drop, but I can't take a 40% drop. Mm -hmm. People always um, don't guess very well what they'll be able to take before it happens either. So it's better to be a little conservative there. But if you're truly a long-term investor, you should be mostly long. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Warren Buffett uh, has his uh, wife being 90% uh, net long the index and 10% in cash. Right. When he dies. In case she needs money when right. he dies. <laughs> yeah. And thinks she'll do well. And, and I, I'm sort of of the same mind, you know, for two reasons. One, I think he's right. And two, it's Warren Buffett. So he's usually right. <laughs> Morningstar says that the Gotham Index Plus Fund's fees are too high. And they have your fees at better than 3%. What's your response to that criticism? Uh, sure. Well, the way they account for fees at the moment uh, isn't doing it the way that we uh, would look at it. Our management fee is only 1%. We cap our other expenses at 0.15%, so that adds up to 1.15%. What Morningstar is included, because it's included in our SEC filings, is that when we short a stock, we owe dividends to the owner of that stock. But it excludes the dividends that we earn on the stocks that we're long. All right. So for the record, 1.15% is the fee that you think is the, the accurate fee for the Gotham Index Plus Fund. Thanks for asking the question, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. The last time you were on over a year ago, it was the Vanguard Value ETF VTV. So value Vanguard's value ETF? I would stick with that. Yep. Uh, you know, I think despite the fact that uh, that type of value investing mm -hmm. has not worked for quite a long time, right. when you uh, analyze the portfolio and the stocks that they're in, I think uh, investors are getting a relative bargain to the S&P today. And, you know, it's had a long period of underperformance, that type of value. And so I think it's a good long-term hold. A piece of advice for individual investors, given the fact that we've had this 10-year bull market uh, stock prices are pretty expensive. Do you have any advice for individual investors on, on kind of how to navigate maybe the next 10 years? Sure. Well, you know, I wrote in my book, The Big Secret, and I'm telling you the answer now because, like I said, it's still a secret. No one read it. Uh, but what I said was, uh, look at your risk tolerance. If you, if you think that if the market falls 40 percent, you can only handle about 25 percent loss of your portfolio, maybe you're better off only being 60 or 70 percent long the market. And when you get bullish, once you decide that, when you get bullish, I'll let you add 10% to that. When you get bearish, I'll let you subtract 10% from that exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you'll be right, you'll be wrong, but I'm trying to limit how much you mess up your portfolio within a, a narrow range. Joel Greenblatt, always a pleasure to have you on Wealth Track. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thanks so much. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is invest with funds and firms that are committed to patient investing. In this short-term oriented world where even perpetual investors like endowments are under pressure to fire funds that underperform for three years and hire funds that outperform for three years, most portfolio managers and their firms don't have the patience, ability, or desire to stick with a long-term investment strategy. Remember all of the funds that weren't invested in the dot-com craze that lost most of their investors? Great investors such as Jean-Marie Eveillard at First Eagle and Stephen Romick at FPA Crescent were among them, but their firms backed their investment approach and discipline, which ultimately paid off big time. A firm's culture, independence, and dedication to investment excellence makes a huge difference to investment returns. 
Those independent managers are the ones we seek out to interview on Wealth Track.